Chapter 7 They started at the box, which was closed at the moment. Double doors of metal laying flat on the ground, covered in white paint, faded and cracked. The day had brightened considerably. The shadows stretched in the opposite direction from what Thomas had seen yesterday. He still hadn't spotted the sun, but it looked like it was about to pop over the eastern wall at any minute. Albie pointed down at the doors. This here is the box. Once a month we get a newbie like you. Never fails. Once a week we get supplies, clothes, some food. Ain't needing a lot. Pretty much run ourselves in the glade. Thomas nodded, his whole body itching with a desire to ask questions. I need some tape to put over my mouth, he thought. We don't know Jack about the box, you get me? Albert continued. Where it came from, how it gets here, who's in charge. The shanks that sent us here ain't told us nothing. We got all the electricity we need, grow and raise most of our food, get clothes and such. Tried to send a slinthead greenie back in the box one time. Thing wouldn't move till we took him out. Thomas wondered what laid under the doors when the box wasn't there, but held his tongue. He felt such a measure of emotions, curiosity, frustration, wonder, all laced with lingering horror seeing the griever that morning. Albie kept talking, never bothering to look Thomas in the eye. <clears throat> Glade's cut into four sections. He held, up, he held up his fingers as he counted up the next four words. Gardens, bloodhouse, homestead, deadheads. You got that? Thomas hesitated, then shook his head, confused. Albie's eyelids fluttered briefly as he continued. Looked like he could think about, of a thousand things he'd rather be doing right then. He pointed to the northeast corner where the crops and fruit trees were. Gardens, where we grow our crops. Water's pumped in through pipes in the ground, always has been, or we'd have starved to death a long time ago. Never rains here. Never. He pointed to the southeast corner at the animal pens and barn. Bloodhouse, where we raise and slaughter animals. He pointed to the pitiful living quarters. Homestead, stupid place is twice as big when the first of us got here. Because we kept adding to it and they send us wooden clunk. Ain't pretty, but it works. Most of us sleep outside anyway. Thomas felt dizzy. So many questions splintered his mind he couldn't keep them straight. Albie pointed to the southwest corridor, the forest area frosted with several sickly trees and benches. Call that the deadheads. Graveyards back in that corner in the thicker woods. Ain't much else. You can go there and sit and rest, hang out, whatever. He cleared his throat, as if wanting to change subjects. You'll spend the next two weeks working one day apiece for our different keepers until we know something you're best at. Slopper, bricknick, bagger, track hoe, something will stick, always does. Come on. Albie walked toward the south door located between what he'd called the deadheads and the bloodhouse. Thomas followed, wrinkling his nose up at the sudden smell of dirt and manure coming from the animal pens. A graveyard, he thought? Why do you need a graveyard in a place full of teenagers? That disturbed him even more, not knowing some of the words. Sorry. That disturbed him even more than not knowing some of the words Albie kept saying, like slopper and bagger. That didn't sound so good. He came as close to interrupting Albie as he had done so far, but willed his mouth shut. Frustrated, he turned his attention to the pens in the bloodhouse area. Several cows nibbled and chewed at a trough full of greenish hay. Pigs lounged in muddy pit, an occasionally flickering tail was the only sign that they were alive. Another pen held sheep, and there were chicken coops and turkey cages as well. Workers bustled about the area, looking as if they spent their whole lives on a farm. Why do I remember these animals? Thomas wondered. Nothing about them seemed new or interesting. He knew what they were called, what they normally ate, what they looked like. Why was this stuff still lodged in his memory, but not where he had seen the animals before, or with whom? His memory, memory, lo sorry, his memory loss was baffling in its complexity. Albie pointed to the large barn in the back corner, its red paint long faded to the dull rust color. Back there is where the slicers work. Nasty stuff, that. Nasty. If you like blood, you can be a spl slicer. Thomas shook his head. Slicer didn't sound good at all. As he kept walking, he focused his attention on the other side of the glade, the section Albie called the deadheads. The trees grew thicker and denser the farther back in the corner they went, more alive and full of leaves. 
Dark shadows filled the depths of the wooded area, despite the time of day. Thomas looked up, squinting to see the sun was finally visible, though it looked odd, more orange than it should be. It hit him that this was yet another example of the odd selective memory in his mind. He returned his gaze to the deadheads, a glowing disc still floating in his vision. Blinking to clear it away, he suddenly caught the red lights again, flickering and skittering around deep in the darkness of the woods. What are those things, he wondered, irritated that Newt hadn't answered him earlier. The secrecy was very annoying. Albie stopped walking, and Thomas was surprised to see they had reached the south door. The two walls bracketed the exit towering above them. The thick slabs of gray stone were cracked and covered in ivy, as ancient as anything Thomas could imagine. He craned his neck to see the top of the walls far above. His mind spun with an odd sensation that he was looking down and not up. He staggered back a step, awed once again by the structure of his new home, then finally returned his attention to Albie, who had made back to the, who had his back to the exit. Out there is a maze. Albie jumped a thumb, jabbed a thumb over his shoulder, then paused. Thomas stared in that direction through the gap in the walls that served as an exit from the glade. The corridors out there looked much the same as the ones he'd seen from the window by the east door earlier that morning. This thought gave him a chill, made him wonder if a griever might come charging toward them at any moment. He took a step backward before realizing what he was doing. Calm down, he chided himself, embarrassed. Albie continued, Two years I've been here. Ain't none been here longer. The few before me are already dead. Thomas felt his eyes widen, his heart quicken. Two years we tried to solve this thing, no luck. Shucking walls move out there at night just as much as these here doors. Mapping it out ain't easy. Ain't easy no how. He nodded toward the concrete brick blocked building into which the runners had disappeared the night before. Another stab of pain sliced through Thomas's head. There were too many things to compute at once. They'd been here two years? The walls moved out in the maze? How many had died? He stepped forward, wanting to see the maze for himself, as if the answers had printed on the walls out there. Albie held out a hand and pushed Thomas in the chest, sending him stumbling backwards. Ain't no going out there, Shank. Thomas had to suppress his pride. Why not? You think I sent Newt out there? Sorry. You think I sent Newt to you before the wake-up just for kicks? Freak? That's the number one rule. The only one you'll never be for, forgiven for breaking. Ain't nobody, nobody allowed in the maze except for the runners. Break that rule, and if you ain't killed by the grievers, we'll kill you ourselves. You get me? Thomas nodded, grumbling inside, sure that Albie was exaggerating. Hoping that he was. Either way, if he had any doubt about what he told Chuck the night before, it had, been complete, it had now completely vanished. He wanted to be a runner. He would be a runner. Deep inside, he knew he had to go out there, into the maze. Despite everything he learned and witnessed firsthand, it called to him as much as hunger and thirst. A movement up on the left wall of the south door caught his attention. Startled, he reacted quickly, looking just in time to see a flash of silver. A patch of ivy shook as the thing disappeared into it. Thomas pointed up at the wall. What was that? He asked before he could be shut down again. Albie didn't bother looking. No questions till the end, Shank. How many times I gotta tell you? He paused, then let out a sigh. Beetle blades. It's how the creators watch us. You better not. He was cut off by a booming, ringing alarm that sounded from all directions. Thomas clamped his hand to his ears, looking around as, it, as the siren blared, his heart about to thump its way out of his chest. But when he focused back on Albie, he stopped. Albie wasn't acting scared. He appeared confused, surprised. The alarm clanged through the air. What's going on? Thomas asked. Relief flooded his chest that his tour guide didn't seem to think the world was about to end. But even so, Thomas was getting tired of being hit by waves of panic. That's weird, was all Albie said as he scanned the glade, squinting. Thomas noticed people in the bloodhouse, pens, glancing around, apparently just as confused. One shouted to Albie, a short, skinny kid drenched in mud. What's up with that? The boy asked, looking to Thomas for some reason. I don't know. 
Albie murmured back in a distant voice. But, tell me, but Thomas couldn't stand it any longer. Albie, what's going on? The box, shuck face, the box, was all Albie said before he set off for the middle of the glade at a brisk pace that almost looked to Thomas like panic. What about it? Thomas demanded, hurrying to catch up. Talk to me, he wanted to scream at him. But Albie didn't answer or slow down, as that they, and as they got closer to the box, Thomas could see that dozens of kids were running around the courtyard. He spotted Newt and called to him, trying to suppress his rising fear, telling himself things would be okay, that there had to be a reasonable explanation. Newt, what's going on? he yelled. Newt glanced over at him, then nodded and walked over, strangely calm in the middle of the chaos. He swatted Thomas on the back. It means a bloody newbie's coming up in the box. He paused as if expecting Thomas to be impressed. Right now. So? As Thomas looked clo more closely at Newt, he realized what he had mistaken for calm was actually disbelief, maybe even excitement. So, Newt replied, his jaw dropping slightly. Greeny, we've never seen two newbies show up in the same month, much less two days in a row. And with that, he ran off toward the homestead.